I am obviously not Fran Inman, uh, but Fran will be here shortly, but we wanted to respect your time and get started uh, on time. Welcome. Uh, the California Transportation Commission is pleased to present um, morning and afternoon panel presentations covering two timely important topics, policy recommendations for transportation infrastructure resiliency and approaches to increase transit ridership. Oh, and with that, Fran comes to, is coming to the stage, so I will keep going, but she will be here shortly and take over from me. Uh, the California Transportation Commission, as many of you know, is an independent state commission responsible for programming and allocating funds for construction of highway passenger rail, transit, and active transportation improvements throughout California. Transportation, this forum's purpose is to foster a lively and informative discussion that will help generate policy recommendations for the commission's 2019 annual report to the legislature. So why did we select resiliency and increasing transit ridership for our two key focus areas of the forum? Governmental agencies in California have been working to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and this has been a very important uh, over the last 10 years to help address climate change. However, California is also needs to be prepared for increasing storm and fire activity. The commission is interested in exploring how to improve planning for climate change impacts to our transportation infrastructure. While we know Caltrans is conducting uh, vulnerability studies on the state highway system, we look forward to hearing from our panelists today whether there are additional measures that could be taken to adequately plan and implement protect transportation infrastructure. Recent data indicates that transit ridership in both California and also nationally is decreasing. We need to find ways to turn this troubling trend around. Although funding tends to be the first thing that comes to mind regarding how to increase rider, transit ridership, we know significant increase funding by SB1 has been directed to transit, but despite this investment, ridership has to continued to decline. We need to find ways to offset transit declines by addressing user concerns with the eroding quality of transit services, increases in fee, fares, and new technology opportunities that can streamline the purchase of tickets for multiple modes of transit service. We look forward to hearing from the experts here today on policy solutions that could be implemented to increase ridership. We look forward to today's panels and thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be a part of our discussion. So I would like to introduce our moderator for panel, uh, panel number one, uh, Karen Philbrick serves as the Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute, MTI, at San Jose State University, uh, I believe go Spartans, right? Go Spartans. Okay. Over the past five years and is responsible for long-term financial and strategic initiatives. Karen, please take it away. Good morning. Nice to see everyone today. As Garth mentioned, I have the pleasure of serving as the Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. Better known as MTI, we are a competitively selected university transportation center. We oversee a large national consortium funded through the U.S. Department of Transportation, and perhaps even more importantly, we lead the research consortium for the 23-campus California State University system. And that research and workforce development portfolio is funded through Senate Bill 1. It's my honor today to moderate this panel on infrastructure resiliency, a very critical topic. As we all know, extreme weather events have recently caused massive disruption to the communities and to our transportation systems. Transportation is one of the 16 critical infrastructures that have been identified in our nation. If attacked or destroyed, it could have a significant impact on our economy, on our health and safety, and on our national security. And for this reason, we have brought together experts today to talk about how to address transportation infrastructure resiliency. To prepare for the likelihood of extreme events, agencies can apply strategies and best practices to improve resilience by applying a structured approach, we can ensure the return to life 
as we know it and for businesses and communities to return to some aspect of normal. To that end, there's been a shift in policy in recent decades that many of you are likely aware of. We've shifted from risk reduction and protection of critical infrastructure assets to improving infrastructure resilience. And when I see resilience, it means the ability to absorb and quickly recover from events, from a wide range of hazards, both direct, such as a terrorist attack, or natural disasters. Yet a review of the literature in preparation for this panel yielded the fact that there's no one approach to resilience planning. In fact, there's a lack of a well-established definition and integration of resilience practice within transportation. A recent report identified three uh, key shortcomings, lack of a definition, lack of a clearly described quantitative relationship between risk and resilience, and finally, a lack of consistent metrics to measure resilience. Now, as we look further into the research to help frame this issue, we look toward the National Research Council. They define resilience, and I quote, as the ability to prepare and plan for, absorb, recover from, and more successfully adapt to adverse events. A recent 2018 NCHRP report of state DOTs showed us that the one consistency among DOTs in their definitions was the ability to adapt and return to service. That's something we all agreed to. But in looking at plans, whether we're talking about state DOTs or transit agencies, we really want to focus on the four main attributes of resilience. That's robustness is the first. We call it the four R's. Robustness is the ability of a system to withstand disaster forces without significant degradation or loss of performance. The second R is redundancy, the extent to which systems are substitutable, that is capable of taking over functioning in face of significant degradation or loss of performance. The third, very important, resourcefulness, the ability to diagnose and prioritize. That is very important in the event of a disaster, as we'll hear from our panelists. And finally, rapidity. That's the capacity to restore functionality in a timely way, containing losses and avoiding disruptions to every extent possible. To date, agencies have begun to address these issues through design, operation, and maintenance. So finally, the overarching findings from a 2015 National Infrastructure Advisory Council report that gives recommendations to the president, and in 2015, we know who that president was, and he listened well, and the three observations and recommendations to address resiliency include the following. Systematic risks are not well understood. This is a challenge, not by mode, not by jurisdiction, region, or the interdependence between the 16 critical infrastructures. Second, while the nation resilience policies are becoming well established, they're not integrated into practice. They're there, but now they need to be integrated. Third, chronic underinvestment. That's a problem we all face, but the lack of monetization has limited the integration of resilience into investments. But there's good news. There are recommendations for improvement and for change going forward. It includes creating a baseline of current risks and, ex and establishing a federal vision for transportation resilience. The second, developing analytical tools, models, and exercises to better understand the plan for emerging risks and interdependencies. And finally, using the results of these efforts to operationally define resilience and to implement effective federal practices, procedures, and procurement processes. Why are we here? Because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. When will the next direct or natural disaster occur? And what will we as transportation professionals collectively do to save lives and to continue moving people and goods. Without further ado, let's turn now to our panel of experts. Now, they each 
have distinguished careers in their own right, and I could go into great detail about their many accomplishments. But we really have limited time, and we want to hear from their expert point of views. So I invite you to read their bios on the CTC website in further detail. First, let's hear from Dennis Schmidt, Director of Public Works for Butte County. Good morning, everybody. Okay, well, we're getting this going. Uh, first, thanks for this opportunity, Jose. Thanks for uh, working with us and figuring out how to get our schedules to work. And uh, certainly, Karen, thanks for the gracious introduction. And thanks to the CTC commissioners for uh, giving us this opportunity to present our, our story, our side of the world, if you will. Uh, I'm going to talk about, the, well, I, I'm Dennis Schmidt. I'm director of public works. I've been in that position for about three years. So it's been a very interesting three years for me because we have certainly have been tested with some of these not, uh, not if but when things. We've had two of the when things have happened to us. Has anybody here not heard of the Orville Spillway disaster? Okay, how about the campfire? Anybody not hear about that? Okay, so I'm not going to labor you with the details of that. You've all seen that. I'm going to talk a little bit about these two failures and what they did to our infrastructure because this all ties back to resiliency of the roadway systems and the infrastructure. Uh, the left obviously is a spillway and the right is a uh, satellite image of the campfire probably about 10.30 in the morning, about four hours into the, uh, the event. So some of the common elements of these disasters uh, required massive evacuations across all jurisdictional lines. Uh, many of you in this room may actually have been evacuated during the spillway incident because it reached all the way down into Sacramento, the potential impacts had that uh, spillway failed and released that wall of water. The spillway in question was built in 1966, 51 years old at the time of failure. That's a pertinent fact. The campfire, the PG&E transmission line that failed uh, caused the resulting inferno and unfortunately the death of 85 people was nearly 100 years old at the time of its failure. So Jose asked me to wrap up this entire presentation into three legislative recommendations. So here they are. Uh, going to encourage you as a group to help us figure out how to harden our evacuation routes. And this is primarily dealing with fire, but I think it's appropriate to other hazards as well, because certainly we have flood hazards. We have dams upstream of a lot of big communities that uh, you look at how you're going to evacuate Sacramento in one hour like we were given in Orville, that would be a difficult task to do. And I, I doubt that the agencies are up for that task right now. Encourage boots on the ground, multi-county evacuation efforts. Uh, the, the good thing of all these disasters is Butte County has gotten really good at managing these things. I have a list of phone numbers now that at 2 o'clock on a Sunday morning, I can make things happen and get roads closed and, uh, and get transit buses where they need to be. I can get those, those things moving that we need to have happen to respond to a disaster. Before these two emergencies, we collectively as a county did not have that. We thought we did, but we had their, their uh, eight to five numbers. We had contacts that had moved on. We didn't have a good list of contacts. We didn't really know how to work together. This event tested us beyond our wildest imagination, but it made us learn in the process. The last bullet point, uh, this has been, being in public works this is my pet peeve. It's been that way for a long time, is if you want to maintain your infrastructure, remember the two disasters I'm talking about were man-made caused by infrastructure failures, not a natural disaster. If we want to maintain that infrastructure, go ask the engineers in charge of that. What do they need to maintain it? They will tell you. That's what engineers do. They'll give you a list, Excel spreadsheet, and down to the ninth detail, and then figure out a way to fund that. Right now, our, our process is we fund everything else, and then whatever's left over gets shoveled off to the maintenance of our roadways, our bridges, our dams, and that's not a good way of funding infrastructure. So some of the lessons from the campfire or some of the, uh, the bullet points, uh, again, 85 lives lost, 18,000 structures were burned, 50,000 people were evacuated, and this literally occurred in like an hour and a half. We had to try to move 50,000 people. Uh, our real estate market is completely turned upside down. There's no housing anywhere, uh, massive damage to utilities, and, uh, and that's a typo. There's a, we estimate over 600,000 mature trees killed by the heat of the fire. 
this photo, uh, there's literally hundreds of photos like this. This is Pearson Road in the town of Paradise, not in the county jurisdiction, but I think it's a great graphic example. We're talking about hardening of infrastructure. This is what happens if it's not hardened. Uh, you'll see utility poles down. What happened is cars would uh, either catch on fire while they were trying to get out, or they would get stopped in traffic, and then they would, uh, their cars would catch on fire. They had to abandon their cars and flee on foot. So I'm going to try to give you a little taste of uh, this was a day after, and uh, this is uh, near that same area, Pearson Road, in the town of Paradise. So that was the CHP vehicle you just saw that was disabled. I'm not sure what uh, the issue was with it, but you're going to see lots of cars that are burned up. They've actually, this is less than 24 hours in, into the incident. Public Works has already been there, either Public Works or Cal Fire Dozers, pushing cars off the side of the road. Before November 8th, we talked about that in training, but we never actually did it in reality. And that was a thing in this event. We learned and adapted, and uh, we actually sent a crew out the day of the incident to physically lift cars and push them off the road so we could get roadways back open to help people evacuate. That was certainly not within the job description of my public works guys that were sent to do that, but it was uh, something that had to be done and help save lives in the process. So again, you're, you're gonna see lots of evidence of trees. Uh, this area was an urban forest. It had trees 120, 130 feet tall, lots of brush. This was heavily built up community, uh, homes every 100 feet, something like that. But you'll see the power lines on the, uh, on both power and communication lines on the laying on the side of the ground. You'll see the examples of the, uh, the power poles in the middle of the roadway. Um, just a lot of impediments but being able to use this roadway for an evacuation. So I talked about hardening of utilities. Uh, certainly overhead utilities are a big piece of that. Uh, in my mind we have two options. We either put them underground or we do something other than highly flammable poles that we mount everything on. Um, I'm not a PG&E expert, I'm not a utility expert, but the, the layman in me says you're, you're creating a situation where you're asking all those utilities to fall down in the middle of the roadway. In my opinion, we're just extremely lucky that we did not electrocute any first responders or any uh, civilians during this event because I talked to, talked to fire guys that actually had the cables wrap up around their, their axles. They had to get underneath there with uh, shears and cut those things out so they could continue to evacuate people. This is a shot of uh, Ponterosa Way up in Magalia showing uh, blackened trees on the ground. Uh, where that, that is still in process is removing trees. PG&E had tried very hard to clear the, the uh, power lines from uh, what they considered to be hazardous trees. They had a good start on it when the fire hit. At this point there, about 90,000 trees have been put on the ground to uh, eliminate them as a potential hazard from striking lines. This is a big job. We're talking literally hundreds of thousands of trees. So in hardening of uh, roadways, this is an example of a roadway that was actually used for the evacuation. It did not burn, but you can see on the left is a, uh, is a photo of a, a basically, a, a, as it sits today, a roadway that's had no effort to put on it. In a hot wind-driven fire, that's not a place you want to be. On the right is a uh, photo showing an area that a local timber company had, did, had performed a, basically creating a fire break for their own properties and they said, hey, can we extend this into the county right away? And we should, said, sure, go ahead. So certainly on the right, that road is survivable. And this is one of the main, it was, was one of the main evacuation routes out of Paradise. So one of the unsung heroes in my mind of the, uh, the evacuation was Forest Highway 171. Many of you probably haven't heard of it. There may have been, a few of you that have been around for a long time may have actually helped to get that funded and get it in place. About 10 years ago, they finished construction on it. This was always billed as an escape route for Paradise because uh, they knew that we, we had a lot of risks with the, the geographic layout of Paradise. And this was a continuation of a paved roadway up to Butte Meadows, which eventually tied them into State Highway 32. Like say, this was built 10 years ago. It's been operating just fine as a recreational road into federal lands, um, but this was called into, into service on November 8th, and in my opinion, it saved thousands of lives by having this roadway available. 
So again, we're talking 20 to $30 million construction costs. That's a lot of money, but when you balance it against the number of lives that were saved, uh, probably a pretty good investment. Multi-county evacuation planning. Uh, we all are required to have evacuation plans. They use on their binder about this thick. They sit on somebody's shelf and uh, you pull them out once a year to do an exercise, but is it really functional? In my mind, those binders are great because they keep you in compliance with state and federal regulations, but what you need is that two-page document. That two-page document that you have developed with the key players in your community that tells you exactly how to get stuff done. I don't need a treatise on ICS. We all know how to do that. I need to know who to call and how to make things happen. If you need to close down Highway 99, who are you gonna call to do that and does he have the authority to do that? Uh, we actually ran into that our, in, our in, in the efforts to reduce the gridlock in Chico, we called CHP and said we need to shut down Highway 99 at Los Molinas and in Yuba City. That's not a call you make every day, but th that's how desperate it was to try to reduce that traffic load and create some extra capacity in the roadways. I'm not going to talk a lot about the nationwide infrastructure, maintenance funding shortfall, other than saying it's real, it's out there, there's a ton of documentation on this. Uh, surface transportation, they figure that the uh, shortfall we have is over a trillion dollars. Uh, dams and bridges are also tr in the billions of dollars, the shortfall that we have over the next 10 years. Having lived through the spillway incident, dams are really important to me now. I, I realize how important it is. They just sit there, they, they don't make any noise, they mind their own business until suddenly something goes wrong. And again, ask your engineers, those top engineers, those old guys have been there for 20 years, they know exactly what needs to be done, but they keep hitting brick walls when they go to get funding to do it. And we collectively as a community, as a group, need to figure out how to open some of those doorways up and get them the dollars they need to keep these, this infrastructure safe. And the big red note, both of these multi-billion dollar disasters were caused by the failure to properly maintain infrastructure. So you bring this back to California's infrastructure maintenance shortfall American Society of Civil Engineers does a report every year. Uh, right now they give our bridges a C minus, our roads a D, and transit a C minus in terms of condi overall condition of our infrastructure. Again, we can't be resilient if we're not maintaining it. If it's uh, full, cracked full of potholes and uh, full of ruts, that next big rainfall comes in, it's gonna do twice as much damage than if it was properly maintained. Just a quick run through some of the things that was destroyed during the campfire. Uh, guardrail posts and guardrails are all laying on the ground. Uh, not very effective that way. We lost about 16,000 linear feet of guardrail in about three hours. Uh, the, the challenge with that is the roadway's closed until you can get that guardrail back in. And that's a big emergency contract. Uh, we tapped out the three big local contractors and the one that got the job was the one who had enough in inventory in order to put these roads back together because this was a major roadway in and out and of course we couldn't open it because of the risk having uh, unprotected uh, canyons. Burn signs, we had probably 300 signs burned up. Uh, this, this scene was repeated literally thousands of times across Butte County and uh, across Paradise putting the infrastructure back because virtually everything burned up, every pole burned up. Tree crews, this is a work in progress. Uh, early on, it was really unregulated. As a public works department, we had no idea who was working where. And because it, it was just complete chaos. And we had to not get in the way to slow things down because we were frantically trying to get the roadways open back up. Log decks, PG&E used our public right of ways to place many of those 90,000 trees they removed. Uh, of course, there you've got additional loading onto the roads. Uh, unconventional type of loading. You don't normally don't have skid loaders running on paved public roadways. Honey Run Bridge, it was destroyed by the fire. So debris flows, that's, that's a new thing. I've never, I've been in this for quite a while and I've never experienced a debris flow before. I can tell you they're not a lot of fun. Uh, the first one happened about three weeks after the campfire hit. Uh, we were hit with what we figured about a three, the equivalent of a 300 year storm, right centered right over the top of the, the burn area and just really made a mess out of things. Then two weeks later, we got hit with another one. After we had just got all the debris cleaned up out of the culverts, we got hit with another one. So one of the, uh, we, we use the term shelter in place a lot now. It's, it's part of our normal conversation in Butte County. It's just kind of a weird thing. 
Fire debris trucks, this is ongoing today. It's Monday today, so they're back at work today. We have roughly 2,000 trucks uh, running around. Uh, their listed capa weight capacity is 69,000 pounds for the Super 10s. Uh, many of these, when we clocked them coming in our local landfill, were over 100,000 pounds. So they have completely destroyed the main haul routes into our Neo Road landfill, and many of the other haul routes are uh, well on their way to being destroyed. We work with our partners with CHP certainly to try to arrest some of that behavior, because that is a felony when you get that, that heavy. Uh, they made it, it, it was tough on the driver because they don't have any control of these. They're, remote, they're loaded by a guy in a loader and the driver is required to stay in his truck, but still he's responsible. So how much damage, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we're going to run out of time, but uh, we're figuring anywhere from 10 to 15 years where the damage is going to occur in one year uh, as part of this cleanup. How to fix it, our average PCI or pavement condition index was up in the low 70s we're going to be probably in the mid 30s for all the haul routes the roads that are being used to haul uh, haul this fire ash and debris out so what does it all mean uh, certainly butte county is looking for additional resources we've been talking with our partners at cal recycle and uh, and with cal recycle cal oes and fema we've got them on speed dial we know who they are and they know what our issues are we're trying to figure out how to fit paradise's uh, puzzle into their their funding cycle they're really adept at funding hurricane re reconstruction, not so much on wildfires. So uh, I think they're learning some things out of this as well as we are learning a ton about how to work through their system. Uh, I'm, I'm throwing out a number of $150 million. We've got about 150 miles within the burn scar that I think is probably gonna need to be reconstructed by the time we get done. And that's dwarfed only by the cost to remove the hazard trees. Uh, we figure we're about $15 million to remove the trees just in within the right of way. And then we've got uh, hundreds of millions of dollars that will be for trees that could affect the right of way but are not technically the county's responsibility. So we're still working again with FEMA and Cal OAS to try to figure out how to fund that because it's, it's definitely a risk to the county roadways. And uh, Jose's giving me a sign to wrap up. So. That's it. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Dennis, before I ask if the audience has any questions of you, I have two points of clarification. On one of your slides, you indicated there were still 60,000 trees to be removed ASAP but then you verbally said 600,000 trees. Can you clarify? Yes, that was a typo that 600,000 is the total number of trees within the burn scar that need to be removed. There okay. are 6,000 within the public right of way that we're uh, out to bid on right now. Thank you, and then the second thing you said, and I didn't quite get it completely, you said the, the 10 to 15 years worth of use, what was the figure that you cited at the end? I, the, the figure there was, I, I figure we're doing about 10 to 15 years worth of damage in one year on our roadways that are part of the haul routes. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna, we have a little bit of extra time today. So if you have questions specifically for Dennis, I invite you to ask them now, but we'll also have a moderated Q&A at the end of this panel where questions can be asked of all three of our speakers. Does anybody have a, a question about these two incidents at this moment in time? Yes, okay. please, Thanks. Commissioner. Um, very good presentation. <clears throat> Just uh, we heard a lot about the um, PVC piping and fencing and that sort of thing when we were uh, did the tour of Paradise. What's the status of your water quality now? And uh, you know, just give me a brief update. I'll give you the, just the, the general overview. I don't work for PD, P, or PI the Paradise Irrigation District, so I can't speak officially for them. I know that they have uh, a, a number of properties, probably on the order of 40 to 50, that now have an all clear to where they're enabled to use the water for any purposes. The majority of the town is still under a, a, a no contact order, so uh, they are still hauling in water into tanks and using water that way. Their, their water is clean coming out of the filtration plant, it's just that they have problems within the piping system itself. It was contaminated through the fire. Thank you. Okay. Well, be sure you jot down your questions if some come to mind. Let's hear now from Don Hubbard, Senior Technical Principal at WSP USA. And 
Don, I was looking at your background in preparation for today, and I see you can address us in either Thai or English. So that's pretty impressive. I'll start with English. Let's start with English. <laughs> can you? Good. So, good morning. Um, I'm here to tell you about uh, the work we've been doing to assess the vulnerability of the state highway system to the effects of climate change. And I'll start out by saying that although this presentation draws on material from Caltrans, I'm not a Caltrans employee and I'm not speaking for the agency. Uh, the opinions uh, that, I, uh, that I have are my own. So I'm going to start out by giving you some background to the current work, and then the main part of my presentation will be to discuss the vulnerability assessments and then the follow-on project, which is called the Climate Action Report. I'll close by discussing the lessons learned and the recommendations for the long term. So some background. As you're probably aware, since 2016, all state agencies in California are required by law to consider the effects of climate change in all investment decisions. So the projects that I've been working on are to help Caltrans to fulfill this mandate. But in fact, Caltrans was already looking at the, uh, at the effects of climate change before these laws were enacted just as part of their good management practice. Part of the reason they were doing this is because events in the field made climate change impossible to ignore. For example, the particularly wet winter we had a couple of years ago caused more than a billion dollars worth of damages to Caltrans facilities. And these are very important facilities. The state highway system is the backbone of the transportation system in California. And during emer emergencies, it's even more important because the, the uh, state highway system is the main evacuation routes taking people out of danger. It also serves as the main entryways, access routes for first responders getting into the problem area. They often also serve as physical uh, lines of defense, for example, as a fire break or as an embankment against mud flows or, or floodwaters. Of course, Caltrans isn't just concerned about highways because they're the owners of these facilities, they're also concerned about the effects on the users. So when climate change closes down a highway, it can affect people and facilities even a long distance away. For example, 40% of the, of the foreign trade of the United States passes through the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. But at, uh, during the summer of 2015, two separate incidents closed the, the main highways between those ports and the rest of the United States. That's the I-15 Cajon, uh, Cajon Pass fire and some flooding on I-10 that, that washed out a bridge. As a result of those two incidents, Road, um, supply chains were disrupted across the country. So just-in-time inventory systems cannot function when ships can't unload because cargoes can't get into and out of the port. So even though the ports were not physically damaged in any way, they were functionally impaired because of problems that occurred quite far away on the state highway system. Linear infrastructure such as roads, power lines, pipes, and railroads are inherently more vulnerable to climate change than point infrastructure like dams or, or, or airports. And the reason is a break anywhere along the line essentially renders the entire line unusable. For example, this is State Route 37 at the north end of San Francisco Bay, and we were looking at Mare Island Bridge and trying to assess its vulnerability to climate change. And what we found is the problem wasn't the bridge, the problem is the approaches on the western side which pass through a marshy area and as you can see there's very low freeboard. So if there's a, a, a significant sea level rise, this is going to be inundated at least part of the time. So that's what most people were looking at. But in fact, another problem occurred earlier than that because on a different section of the road because of a different climate stressor. And that was, there was heavier than usual precipitation that flooded Novato Creek quite some distance from this bridge. And you can see at the top is what the, that section of SR-37 typically looks like, and at the bottom what it looked like during the flood. 
the point being, it isn't good enough to, take a, to strengthen one place in a system. You have to figure out what the weakest links are and, and to any stressor and deal with those first. And the weakest link might be different for different parts of the system. The good news is that Caltrans has been very proactive about this and has been looking into this issue for, for over a decade. They established a climate change branch in, in 2007 and issued guidance on sea level rise in 2011. A few years after that, they, they, did a, uh, they took a look at their own carbon footprint and how the activities of the agency were, um, were uh, affecting greenhouse gas emissions. They followed that up with a pilot vulnerability assessment on one, one part of the north coast. Then in 2015, we started our project, which is to take a look at vulnerability assessments for the entire state highway system. And now we're following that up with, uh, with the next step. One's look at the vulnerability, then the next step is what do we do about it? So Caltrans is well ahead of other state DOTs and is probably one of the leading agencies in California on this. So with that as a background, let me talk about the statewide vulnerability assessments. We looked at the vulnerability of the state highway system to six different types of climate stressors. One was changes to minimum and maximum temperature, changes in precipitation patterns, increased frequency and severity of wildfires, sea level rise, storm surge, and cliff retreat. For the first study, we were looking at mainly as exposure to these different things. Then after the exposure, the second study, we were looking at what the effects of that exposure would be um, and whether or not it would impair the highway. And then lastly, you look at if the highway is impaired, what effect does that have on the users, either for a short-term closure or for a longer-term closure. We've completed the technical work on this for 10 out of Caltrans 12 districts. We'll finish the final two this summer. For these assessments, we drew on the best available data from a wide variety of sources, and I've highlighted the California Energy Commission, which is leading the statewide fourth climate assessment, and SCRIPS because they're producing the precipitation and temperature data. So let me go over how we use this data. The changes to minimum and maximum temperature were taken from the California fourth assessment, and these were compared to the assumptions used in the pavement mixes for Caltrans nine pavement regions. So as you, in case you don't know, um, they use different mixes depending on what sort of uh, conditions they expect in different parts of the state. So this map shows the, uh, the forecast change in maximum temperature in, um, in Caltrans District 6, which is centered on Fresno. And as you can see, by 2085, uh, we're looking at a eight to 10 degree increase in the maximum temperature on the hottest days in, in the summer. So that would certainly be enough to affect, to soften asphalt if you didn't change the mix. But it also affects work crews. It's hot enough in, on, the, on the hottest days in the Central Valley, but when you talk about an eight to 10% increase in temperature, work crews really can't, can't be in operation. So for Caltrans, the change in maximum temperature affects both its designs and its operations. The next stressor is changes in precipitation. And precipitation forecasts are used in the designs of bridges and culverts. They're usually based on what's called the 100-year storm, which is based on past storms, rainfall data that's been collected over the years. In other words, the designs were based on, on data that was correct at the time, but is not particularly indicative of what's going to happen going forward. What's shown in this map is the variation in precipitation in different parts of the country. And as you can see, there's far more variation in precipitation in California than any, uh, anywhere else in the United States. And it's going to become even more variable over time. So the dry years and the droughts are gonna get longer and more severe, interspersed with years in which rainfall is going to be much, much heavier than we've experienced in the past. So Caltrans is gonna to have to change design standards. The definition of a 100-year flood is definitely going to have to change and will now have to be considered in combination with other things like the effects of wildfires on runoff, the effects of rainfall on slopes that are already saturated with earlier rains, and debris flows from earlier fire, fires and storms. 
The droughts are going to lead to more severe at, at, uh, and more frequent wildfires, which have both direct and indirect effects on highways. Some of the direct effects can be seen on this, on, on, in this photo, which is of I-15 after the Cajon fire. As you can see, these are all abandoned vehicles. People were running away as the wildfire passed over the freeway itself. Indirect effects are things like high temperature fires or baking soils so that the rainfall runs off rather than being soaked into the ground. So the same storm produces more rainfall, more runoff than has ha occurred in the past. And vegetation that may have been holding back some of the, some of the water it is now turning into debris that's clogging up the culverts and drains. And on the left, you can see what one of those direct effects. This is a crew trying to put out a fires on a wooden retaining wall that's holding up a section of SR 99, uh, 299. On the right, you see a map of the um, wildfire projections for District 2, which is headquartered in, in Reading by 2055. The red lines show the parts of the state highway system where there is a, a high risk of wildfire. And as you can see, by 2055, it's like 80 or 90 percent of the system um, in that district. Unlike wildfires, cliff retreat only affects a small portion of the state highway system. However, the cost of treatment can be very high. In some cases, the only long-term option is to abandon the road and shift to a new alignment inland. Um, essentially, be, the road would be a complete write-off. This map shows portions of the Pacific Coast Highway near Malibu that would be threatened under different sea level rise scenarios. And as I said before, with linear infrastructure, a break in any of those places essentially renders the rest of the route unusable for through traffic. So we put all this data into district level technical reports for use by the district level staff in their planning work. But as we went along, it became apparent there was a need for a different kind of report because there were also other audiences that needed to be addressed. These are policy level people and external audiences that have a stake in what happens to the state highway system in their area. So we also produced glossy style summary reports for each district. Those aren't actually printed, but they are available on the Caltrans website as virtual books. Here's an example of one page from those um, from the District 4 report for the Bay Area. And if you're familiar with adult learning, you can see how this was designed to, uh, to address a lot of different audiences. And uh, adult learning, you, you, different people absorb information different ways. So you can see we've got, we've got text, we've got call out boxes, we've got a graph, we've got a diagram, we've got tables, we've got a photo. However it is, that particular audience absorbs information. We want them to get the, we want them to get the message. And we're doing this because we're going to have to build consensus as we go along with, uh, as part of the policy dialogue, it isn't Caltrans acting on its own, it's going to be half acting in concert with other actors. We need to get everybody on board with the steps that are, that are required. So now I'll touch briefly on the, on the follow-on project. Uh, the Climate Action Report has three components. One is to update the earlier report um, on the steps that Caltrans has taken to reduce its own carbon footprint. And the news there is quite good. Since uh, 2010, car, uh, Caltrans has cut its own carbon footprint about in half. Um, however, on the new report, we're not just looking at, at what's happening with Caltrans' own operations. We're going to extend that to users of Caltrans facilities, the motorists that are using the highways, and the news there is not likely to be as good. The second component is that we're going through every, every policy, procedure, and guidelines that Caltrans has to find appropriate places for consideration of climate change. So the highway design manual is an obvious place where you might want to make some changes, but there are other places that are more subtle. For example, how it is you schedule maintenance um, in, in light of climate change. The third component follows directly on the vulnerability assessments. We're going to go back to each of the districts take a look at the places that were identified earlier as being vulnerable, determine what's likely to happen, and prioritize um, the, what the follow-on step should be. So with that, lessons learned. I'll close with the lessons I've learned from four years of this. Uh, the first lesson is that California is mainly on its own on this. 
um, to an extent that's not true for other types of engineering issues. Climate, and the reason is climate change is playing out differently in different parts of the country. On the East Coast and Gulf Coast, the main issue is more powerful hurricanes. In the lower, in the lower Midwest, the main issue is more powerful tornadoes and tornadoes occurring in places where they hadn't happened before. In the upper Midwest, it's torrential rainfall. So, uh, uh, so except for sea level rise, the other state DOTs are working on other kinds of problems. They're not, there isn't that much scope for, uh, for mutual support like there would be, we would ordinarily expect for bus rapid transit or, or intersection design or something like that. This is a lot more like seismic issues where California is facing issues that other people aren't and it's going to have to do its own work on this. The second issue is that a lot of people who hate uncertainty are going to have to get used to it. We're going to have to deal with ever-changing forecasts and decisions that may have to be revisited again and again. Nobody likes it, but with the uncertainty that we're facing, we're just going to have to get used to it. Third is, don't assume that there's consensus. We're going to have to build it as we go along, both on not just on whether there's a problem, but what to do about it, who should be in charge of it, when, when action should be taken. The biggest limitation is people. The scale of the adaptation task is enormous and there's only a relatively small cadre of people that are trained in how to do this. And lastly, data is a really good investment. The more you can narrow the range of uncertainty, the less we have to build in safety factors in every design that drive up the cost of every project. Please invest in doing some, uh, some data collection. It really will pay off in the end. I've got three recommendations for the long term. Uh, first, we need a large scale effort to train people in adaptive design. California has 40,000 civil engineers and they know everything there is to know about concrete. They only have a couple of hundred people that understand natural infrastructure. So if we start doing uh, um, adaptive design right now, what are we going to get? A lot of concrete. If we want something else, we're going to have to do some mid-career training for a lot of people to get them going on this new, on a new way of doing things. Staff development tends to have a long lead time, so the earlier we get going on this, the better it's going to be, so that 10 years from now, when we've decided, okay, we've identified the places, we figured out what it is we're going to do, now who's going to do the design and build this thing, that the people are ready when we get to that point. Uh, the, the, AB 1200 um, Climate Safe Infrastructure Group wrote a whole chapter on this in their report on the need to build up a large set of trained people on this. It's well worth reading. Second recommendations on data. Uh, the four climate assessments have been great. Thank you very much. Re really good work. But they're done on a broad level. They're not what we need to design individual projects, which has to be done on a much smaller scale, individual watersheds, and that kind of thing. We're still in the first stages of adaptation, which are the easiest, and we're already bumping into data limitations. For example, the USGS data that we use for sea level rise, it's available for the southern part of California, it's not yet available for the northern part. Um, the data that we need to do hydrologic modeling for Caltrans thousands of, of culverts doesn't yet exist. Even basic data for elevations of bridges is hard to come by. So you can't just wish this stuff into existence. There is a lot of effort that's going to have to be made to get this set so that we can do some serious design work. My last, protect, uh, my last um, recommendation is about legal protection. And that's because I, I didn't consider this a big issue. But then when I ran around to, uh, to all the Caltrans districts, talked to people in a lot of city and county agencies, I can't get through the first meeting on climate change without some engineer telling me they can't do what they think they should do because they're afraid they're going to get sued. For example, they know the rainfall is heavier than before, but if they make the culverts any bigger, they're going to get sued by the landowners downstream for flooding their property. I run into this again and again and again. The general view is that existing design immunity is not enough especially since the courts have said you can lose it when there's change conditions. Well, climate change is nothing but change conditions from one end of the state to the other. So there's a whole lot of engineers that, that think this is a big problem for them and they want to keep doing what they've done in the past because they think it's the only safe thing to do. 
I talk to people in Sacramento, policy level people, they don't think it's a big problem, but uh, the rank and file engineers are really afraid of the lawyers. Okay, so I'd like to suggest that we probably, that if we ask people to change the way infrastructure is built and operated, we're gonna have to make them feel protected, protected that someone's got their back if they do what we ask them to do. And thank you for listening and I look forward to questions. Thank you. So finally, we'll hear from Liz O'Donohue, the Director of Sustainable Development Strategy for the Nature Conservancy. Liz, can we have full 25 minutes? Thanks. So while we're waiting, I just wanted to um, first thank the commission, staff and commissioners for inviting me. And it's also great to be the last person because um, a lot of what you're gonna hear today for me is very consistent and we only did a little bit of planning, so that's pretty cool. Um, and it will also allow me to maybe skip a little bit, um, which is really the first slide, which for me is about um, thinking about how transportation as somebody from the environmental community has really had long standing impacts on the environment. Um, you see fra fragmentation impacts on wildlife, stormwater, um, but with those impacts come opportunity, and the opportunity is about climate change. Um, so with the changing climate, and as um, we've heard from all of our panelists today, we can't continue to, to operate in the way that we have been operating just because of the climate. Um, so what is that opportunity? Um, we can use the best science, creativity, engineering, and partnerships to develop an efficient, cost-effective, climate-resilient transportation network, and one that considers the benefit, benefits of nature as part of the solution. And some of these things you've already seen, so we might have been drawing from the same data. Um, I am a fan of otters. Who loves otters? Okay, everybody loves otters. And one of the things I'm going to talk about um, throughout this presentation is the pilot program that um, AMBAG is managing, um, the Association of Monterey Bay Governments. Heather Adamson is the project manager. And the good thing about this project is um, it incorporates the wide range of stakeholders and it's not just about Caltrans. It's managed by the regional MPO, uh, Transportation Agency of Monterey County, the Nature Conservancy, the Elkhorn Slough Foundation, um, and economic and planning um, consultants were working together to look at the highway, the stretch of Highway 1 that we all know will be impacted in the next few decades. But it also is um, right at the confluence of a, of a nationally important estuary. And so what we're looking at there is not how do you how you know how do you look at the transportation system in a silo but how do you look at it as an integrated system and how do you consider scenarios and alternatives that link improvements to the natural environment and improvements to the transportation network so that you can really work together and I just saw Debbie sitting next to and hi I didn't see you so Debbie is also a leader in this as well um, and so why does the Nature Conserv Conservancy care about it? Because we can see that nature can be part of the solution. So not only can nature have a role because we're all working together and living together, but are there ways for this integrated work to see how improvements to nature can help reduce the risk to the transportation system and therefore what savings and efficiencies can the transportation system gain because of those investments to nature. So when we talk about a climate smart transportation network, we really want to consider it in kind of the big world of an integrated network. One that concerns, considers climate vulnerability, addresses vulnerable hotspots, applies climate smart planning principles, and includes nature-based solutions for multiple benefits. This tracks really well with all of what the, what the panelists said today, 
And we know, um, we just heard about the vulnerability assessments, but what does this really mean? Um, and one thing I wanna say is that, just sitting here listening to the panelists, there's really two ways of thinking about um, resilience. One is response, and one is planning and preparation. And so a lot of what you're going to hear today from me is the planning and preparation to try to, to, try to reduce that risk where we really have to respond. So this idea of sustainability and resilience and nature-based solutions is not a new idea. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny because, you know, this is actually a real-time snapshot from Federal Highways Administration. Um, if you look at the administration, they've scrubbed climate change from everything, but, we, but Federal Highways still has skin in the game in the sustainability and nature-based solutions. And it really tracks all the way back to ecological, which um, goes back uh, almost 20 years ago. And looking at this way to plan together where you can improve the transportation system and improve the environment and you get efficiencies from both. So what do I mean by nature-based solutions? Essentially, this is looking at nature as another asset, as an infrastructure solution. Think of investing in wetlands to reduce sea level rise or absorb storm surge. Um, doing um, forest management for biodiversity outcomes, which also reduces the severity of um, climate risk and the wildfires. Um, and so it really is, it's kind of more of an emerging, but not so much anymore, because there's a lot of data and, and examples of where nature-based solutions help, and, and how is that? We see that they make the systems more resilient, they're cost-effective, they're sustainable, they're easier to permit, it has multiple outcomes, and um, it both helps with adaptation and resilience, but it also helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which is really a long-term solution. So here are some examples. We see that the Metropolitan Transportation Commission is considering a living levy to um, absorb the changes from, storm, from um, storm surge and sea level rise in the Bay Area. There's um, wildlife overpasses to allow for the movement of wildlife as they, are or they are, as they are moving to adapt to a changing climate, and so they're not on the road being struck by cars. We're seeing bioswales. Um, there was one picture, I think, Dennis, that you had of two small culverts that were covered by mudslides. And what we're seeing now is you really wanna open those up to allow for that freer flow of water and wildlife that reduces a lot of the impacts to the transportation system when they fail. So the culverts are a big deal where can we improve those culvert, those vulnerable culvert situations that also improve the ecosystem function and wildlife? And the one on the lower level, on the lower left is Napa River. And instead of looking at a channelized river, the community a, a number of years ago decided to in, in, improve that and restore it as a living and moving river, which also provides um, uh, a lot of recreational opportunities and um, quality of life benefits, but it also has reduced the impacts from flood surges over time. We've talked about this before. There are a lot of policy drivers spanning throughout um, the last decade. Um, and, but some of what we're talking about is, um, is not whether, but how. So what, what we need is changes to policies, culture and practice, and tools and training. Um, and I want to also second what, um, what we were talking about, how Caltrans has been a leader. But part of what we're trying to see is there's a, it's inconsistent. There might be a focus in the climate change branch and there's a lot of great data that's been developed and it's been a slow and, and um, but really vigorous process, but we need to not stop there. It really needs to be integrated through all of Caltrans, addressing the multiple sectors, but we also can't stop there because so much of the transportation system is funded and managed by regions and local transportation agencies. 
and all of those regions and transportation um, agencies have partners. And those partners are not just about the transportation network, but they're also about people like the Nature Conservancy and transit advocates and local community members. And so what we're really talking about here, and this is the tough thing, is, the, is um, culture change. There's been a lot of great work. Um, the um, work that's been done at the state level, um, a lot of adaptation, and throughout a number of these, really all of these reports, they highlight the role of nature-based solutions as an effective and efficient um, uh, effort. Okay, so I'm gonna focus on three policy recommendations, and I'll go through each one. One is that we need to ensure that um, resilience is incorporated in the planning functions. It needs to be well-funded, and demonstrations really make an effort. They really make a difference. Um, and this, again, I want you to think about integrated planning and broad reach. Second is that as the data grows with the benefits of natural infrastructure solutions, it's really important to incentivize that because part of what um, we've been hearing is, and Don just mentioned this, is um, people just don't know best practices. And how can we incentivize those solutions to rise it to the top? And then third, and this tracks really well with what Karen said in the beginning, is how do we tackle that culture change? Let's consider a strong mandate to enable effective change. Okay, first, um, resilience planning and demonstration. So when we, talk, when, um, when we looked at that stretch of Highway 1 and the comment about we need to look at that weakest link, notice how Highway 37 wasn't just the bridge or the entrance to Highway 37. It was looking at it from a corridor approach and a programmatic approach. This is the, this is the approach that the Elkhorn Slough Highway 1 project is taking. And, and so let's look at that both from a programmatic approach, corridor level approach, but also a project level resilience planning, and then incorporate those results. So it's not just an intellectual exercise. So um, in, highway, in SB1, which was a really important bill, that included a number of provisions that um, started to enable um, resilience. One was that in a number of the accounts, it required that whoever, those projects that received money from those accounts needed to incorporate resilience elements into those projects. But it also said, we're effective, we're necessary, we're cost effective, you know. And it had kind of that loophole. So that gets the idea going, but it gives a big opportunity for people to say, well, it wasn't cost effective, or it wasn't appropriate, or we just didn't have the money to do it. So one of the things that we may want to do, and this could be done either in legislation or through CTC practices, is to not let that fall out. To say, make that a high bar rather than a low bar. If you don't have, if you don't have resilient elements, why not? And prove it to me. Um, and start to change that culture so everybody has to consider that. Two is that when there are these programmatic approaches or corridor plans or um, even projects, look at those scenarios or those alternatives to incorporate different elements and where possible to incorporate natural solutions as one of those alternatives or maybe throughout all of those alternatives. And then look at those long range impacts and benefits. Um, when you look at the impacts and benefits at a time of the next, you know, two years, it might not pencil out. But when you look at those benefits and opportunities and impacts over multiple decades, you see that, that the resilience continues and the cost reduces. So think of that long-range impact. Another thing that's really important is this, is not, this work is not funded. And there's really two ways of doing this work. One is incorporating the cost of resilience at the get-go. It's not an add-on. 
it is part of the project and manage that financial impact and that financial investment that way. Um, so that's how I, I'm suggesting you do it. If you keep it as an extra or an add-on, that will never be funded or it will never be funded at the level that we really need it. And therefore, it's never part of the project. Um, and as part of this, think about how the Department of Finance would approve or not approve of this, right? So if they look at, you know, if, if they think of resilience or if um, folks think of resilience as a nice to have and not a need to have, and there's limited funding, that's going to get squeezed out. So we need to change this mandate this is happening, this is necessary, let's start to consider it that way. And then finally on this slide is there are a lot of plans out there, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of great opportunities to really integrate these scenarios and these alternatives with existing plans and that's another way to incorporate the regions and the local communities to look at these multiple benefit outcomes. So here's a plug for um, the Highway 1 um, Elkhorn Sioux project. You can see Highway 1 um, crossing around along Elkhorn Slough. You can see the estuary. Has anybody kayaked in there? Who's kayaked all along there? Okay, you guys have got to get, I mean this is like a world-class resource and it's beautiful and fun and you get to see otters. I guarantee it. This is a really inspiring project. We just had our second stakeholder meeting uh, a week ago or so. And um, it is funded by those demonstration plants, um, programs, these pilots. $20 million was included in SB1 for these demonstration projects. SB1 was a $50 billion 10-year, is that right, Susan? Yeah. Um, it goes what? A dozen sunset, thanks, Frank. Um, but that's a $50 billion investment and $20 million was the start of this. But what we're seeing is we're seeing transformative change, in my opinion, and we're learning a lot through this process. And so I know that we weren't supposed to talk about funding here, <laughs> but I feel like these pilot projects and grants bring people together, the guidelines are solid, and they really create this impetus to make change. And so I would hope that the bucket is there, let's find a way to refill that bucket and not just stop at 20 million. Let's do it so it can really move a lot more effective. Okay, the second um, proposal is to incentivize natural infrastructure solutions. Um, I've talked a lot about this but this is another culture change issue and another training issue and another data best practices issue and another one that I want to tie on is we can't be comfortable with solid data. We have to be comfortable with flexibility, right? So what are those solutions? Let's inspire ourselves to get out of our box to look at how we can look at these multiple benefit outcomes, how do we improve the environment and improve the transportation system together. Um, right now, you can spend money on natural infrastructure solutions, maybe not, depends who you talk to. If somebody really wants to, they can maybe make it work. But let's make it really clear. If you're investing in wetlands restoration to improve the resilience of this roadway, let's make that an eligible expense because that is reducing the risk to that roadway. Um, it is also really important, and the El Consul project is doing this, is using this full life cycle cost methodologies with a long-term horizon. So let's look at it 50, 70, 100 years. What does that look like? When you use natural infrastructure solutions, the cost of maintenance is much lower because you're maintaining the wetlands and you're doing adaptive management, but you're not building for a roadway that 50 years from now will collapse and you'll just have to build it again, right? So let's look at those, um, those economic models that way. Um, another thing is that when we are looking at these alternatives, um, let's develop metrics for ecosystem outcomes. We all know that 
engineers and planners, they do things that can be measured. If there's no metrics that are measured, they won't do it. So one of the things that Elkhorn Slough Project is doing, and also Highway 37 is doing, is they're looking at these metrics for ecosystem um, outcomes, in addition to the outcomes for the transportation system. And super important is training and collaboration on best practices. And I was going to click on to the next slide, but I just want to hover there on one point. Um, in some of the conversations I've heard about what could really make change are these little working groups where people from different places where they sit in different sectors working together on a pro project and a program and it's training and it's collaboration and it's thinking of different solutions. So the human element is really, really important and it's often hard to legislate, right? But you could provide funding or legislative, well, I will click to the next one because this is what it's going into. So strong mandate for durable change. Um, and we did plan a little bit for this panel, but we really didn't. But you could see, I've been listening to the panelists and I've been thinking, what about enabling legislation that actually includes a mandate for a climate smart adapted sustainable transportation network? And I just wanna read those things again. What is that? It's one that considers climate vulnerability, addresses hot spots, applies climate smart planning principles, and includes nature-based solutions. It really tracks to what Karen said. I wrote this down when you were saying what was missing in the literature, okay? A lack of a definition, a lack of a framework, and a lack of metrics, consistent metrics. So why don't we take a stab at that, right? And why don't we make sure it doesn't just sit in the climate change part of Caltrans, because they've been doing excellent work and they've, you know, people have funded these vulnerability assessments. But let's make sure that they lead for a broad-based um, practitioner, culture, multi-sector, multi-level planning approach and implementation approach that adopts all this. So that would require a deep focus with integration across functions ex internally and externally. Training is really important and metrics on resilience and adaptation are also really important. Um, and I think that is it. I'm happy to answer questions. Perfect. Well, we have about 45 minutes for a spirited question and answer period and some rich dialogue. So while you all are thinking about your questions, I would like to share a comment. As I listen to our panel of experts share their points of view, as we discussed infrastructure resilience, I was struck by the human element that Liz brought up and resilience in people. Because when I listen to Dennis share his experience, I think about those first responders. I think about his employees, and I think about the trauma that they're exposed to and what their personal response is. And so when we try to get everything up and running again from an infrastructure point of view, let's not ever lose sight of the human element. Who has questions for our experts? Please, write to the microphone so we can all hear you. Good morning, Susan Reyes from the Association of Independent California Colleges and Universities. And this question is more for Dawn. Uh, what can the higher education segment, uh, specifically, for example, AICCU as an association that represents 84 independent nonprofit colleges throughout the state, what can we do to support the recommendations that you mentioned, whether it be you know, training mid-career professionals or having an influence on design and operations. Question. Um, there's two things that, uh, that are important that academia could do. Number one, there is a lot of data that needs to be collected. Um, they're often, universities are often very good at that. 
uh, there's models to be developed with that data for forecasting, for example, wildfires. Um, when we looked at the forecast for wildfires, we found that we we're using several different models, found that each one used different factors, covered things a different way. Some of the models, for example, would not have forecast what happened in, in Sonoma County, where there's a wildfire that spread into an urban area. Um, it just, the urban areas and, and agricultural areas showed up as blanks on those models. So we ended up having to use several different models in the hope that, every, that we'd catch something. Um, so definitely improvements in the, in the modeling, um, improvements in the data, and then also training. And the analogy that I would use on here is what's done for seismic issues, where uh, the engineering profession in California is done differently than other parts of the United States. Um, all across the U.S., to, to be a civil engineer, you have to pass a test, all-day exam with different things. In California, you have to pass an additional test about seismic issues. If you're coming, if you're an engineer that's trained somewhere else, you're coming to work in California, you have to learn seismic issues if you're going to practice here. I would suggest that climate change things, I don't, I'm not necessarily saying you have to have a different test, but, but to have this sort of mid-career training uh, available, two-week courses, three-week courses, that sort of thing, both available to organizations that can have their staff do it, but also on an individual basis, allow people to sign up for them. That's a great response and very helpful to us who represent higher education in the room. And for many of you, you know that Senate Bill 1 contained a line item to fund transportation research and workforce development, $5 million annually to UCITS and $2 million annually to the California State University system. In regard to the needs you're talking about for data, it's an excellent opportunity to submit a research need because we now have the resources, thanks to many people in this room, to help address that scientific question. It also was not lost on me, Don, that both you and Liz underscored the need for significant training. Next question. I saw somebody's hand over here. Thank you. Yes, I'm curious if there's a, the role the insurance industry has played or will be playing, because clearly on wildfires, um, it's affecting whether homes can get insured, the whole development patterns. Mm -hmm. um, what about the transportation network? Because clearly, Clear. you identify yourself? Yeah, Joe Green Heffern, retired civil engineer and uh, uh, local CR club. Um, but I'm curious if the insurance industry is gonna drive uh, change, apply pressure to improve standards, maybe more, um, more of an integrated transportation network where we only have one route, like Highway 37, in an emergency, that's going to be a, a, a big problem. If there's no rail, there's no, no other highways. So anyway, what role might insurance industry, these external factors, play in driving change? Testing? Yeah. I'll take a stab at that. I certainly don't represent the insurance industry, but I can speak a little bit from what I'm seeing in, the, our, in our community now. From the private sector, insurance is, uh, property owners are seeing a lot of pressure and seeing cancellations of their private policies. Uh, so I, I envision that the rates are gonna go up significantly and uh, it's gonna get much more expensive to live in these high wildland fire areas. I would, I would like to see that the insurance companies get more proactive and do annual inspections, uh, work with the fire departments to make sure that the properties are properly cleared because once the first one catches on fire, it creates an ember storm that will help catch the neighbors, neighboring properties on fire and also the radiant heat will catch anything else on fire. So I, I think the insurance company on the private side is going to help drive a lot of changes. Uh, on the public side, we generally don't have insurance on our roadways and dams and bridges, that type of thing. Um, what our, our insurance agency is a declared disaster and FEMA and working through that process. So any, any changes that would be driven from the, from the local agency side would really be driven by changes in uh, both Cal OES and FEMA. Thank you for that response. And Dennis, you, you sparked my memory as I was looking into your bio and a little bit about your organization in preparation for today. I noted that Butte County has established a 
debris management plan to help property owners properly handle and dispose of fire debris. And there are two options to select from. Can you describe that and what the impact is? You bet, Karen. Uh, we have, have two options of the property owner. You can either sign a right of entry agreement with Cal Recycle and uh, the, the county manages that sign-up process, again, for a tremendous amount of uh, properties, uh, 18,000 structures, something to that effect. Uh, it's, I believe, around a 15 or 18-page document where you have to sign a lot of things certifying you're not going to hold the state uh, responsible and that you will uh, authorize them to accept any insurance payments that you have coming to you for debris removal. So. The state doesn't do it for free. They expect any insurance proceeds geared towards debris to be funded towards them. Uh, so that's one option. The other option is you can go hire your own contractor and do the cleanup yourself through a, a you have to file a plan with the county and uh, you can't just go load it up in your cousin's truck and take it down to the landfill. It's gotta be by certified contractors doing the work. It has to be cleaned to the same level as the state contractors would. And that means that uh, background testing beforehand and then testing afterwards to make sure that all the hazardous materials have been cleaned up and properly disposed of. Thank you. And do we have any questions from our guests online? Hey. Not yet. Okay. Dennis, I'd like to just query you a bit more. When we were doing our planning call, we talked about the Paradise example and the information covered in the town hall meeting. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that rolled out? Yeah, probably that's probably getting a little bit outside of my area's ex expertise because Paradise is a separate jurisdiction and they have their own mayor and their own, uh, their own media that, that mm -hmm. run those, so I'm not intimately involved in that. We work with their public works department on a day-to-day -day basis just because we're, they're, they're in the middle of our jurisdiction, so mm -hmm. we try to work with them and help out whenever we can. But I know they have been doing a lot of uh, electronic uh, Facebook Live type of social media things. This has really been a, a, a very difficult thing for them because they virtually lost their entire town. They, it, luckily or not, they had spared their uh, town hall building, which is a very old building, but uh, everything else in the town has pretty much been destroyed other than a, a few hundred buildings. So it's, uh, if you can imagine all the systems being stressed, their entire town has just been stressed beyond the max that uh, you could expect them to, to deal with. Mm -hmm. But lessons learned from that talked about the importance of breaking down silos and it mirrors some of the comments you made during your presentation of making sure you have the contact details and know who it is that you should be contacting so when disaster strikes at 2 a.m. you're not lost. A absolutely and one of the things that I, I meant to fold in my conversation I didn't because I know we have some transit folks here is you guys really need to recognize that your drivers are first responders. Uh, there's a video online from Santa Rosa that shows a, uh, a transit driver probably got the call, hey, I need you to come in and work overtime, and he had no idea what he was getting into. That's right. So we have worked with CAL FIRE, and uh, we have a three-hour training that we put that we've made available to any agency that has employees that are going to be potentially used in a behind-the-fire scene scenario. If you are a, a water district or a transit driver or any of those uh, type of things where you could end up on the, on the backside of the fire lines, I certainly would encourage you to get your employees a training and uh, consider if they're, if they're routinely going to be part of that evacuation plan, I, I would suggest they ought to have fire shelters and Nomex as well. We purchased Nomex two years ago for all my public works crews and most of them thought I was crazy because they, that we don't go behind fire lines. Well, th in November 8th, a lot of them found themselves on the wrong side of the fire lines, not by choice, but that's where they ended up. So I think that was a, that was a good call. Uh, the good news out of that whole event is we did not lose any first responders, which really surprised me the way that the day developed. So thankful for that. You know, you've said something very important with that example and with transit agency personnel and the critical role they can play in the event of a man-made or natural disaster, and it reminds me of, of the events of 9-11 in New York City and a report called Saving City Lifelines, whereas transit workers were actually responsible for evacuating thousands and thousands of people. 
So thank you for remarking on that. Yeah, and also during the spillway disaster, we called, leaned heavily on the transit providers because we think evacuations, everybody said, well, let's go jump on our cars. Well, there's an awful lot of populations right. that do not have cars and cannot evacuate on their own. Uh, certainly Katrina, we, we saw a lot of that uh, way back in the hurricanes, but that's a real thing here in California too. And we, transit has to be a, a, a key leg to any evacuation plan to help those that can't get out on their own, as well as medical transport for uh, those that, that are not ambulatory. And as we know, a bus can transport up to 42 people, whereas a single occupancy vehicle just causes more congestion. Liz, let's turn to you. How can California better prepare for the impacts of climate change on our existing and planned transportation infrastructure? Just an easy question. There we go. <laughs> Round robin. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a lot. Um, I mean, I think if we break it down to planning, preparation, and then alternatives, I think it really is opening up that box and looking at those components and the sectors and the levels of planning. And also not just stopping at planning, but having the funding and the wherewithal and those little components that make a difference, like I'm thinking what you said, Don, about liability. I think once you dig into it, those things become really important. And I think I firmly believe that you learn by doing. And we just have to take that leap of faith. And I'm seeing Allison and you know District 4 in the Bay Area is really doing a lot of work on resilience. It is the single most important um, threat to the transportation system is sea level rise and then fire and then mudslides and sub subsidence. I mean, it's so we can get paralyzed by the weight of the decision and the alternatives, but I think we need the funding and the mandate to just plow ahead and manage adaptively. I think that's the other key thing. When you start to look at these alternatives, you gotta open up your mind to the what ifs. Well, what if we did it this way? Well, what if we did it that way? Here's a weird um, idea. What if we restore all of those wetlands? What would that look like? Is there funding for that? And how does that pencil out? And so Highway 37 is, on, is, is a really, really good example. Elkhorn Slough, there's a lot of great examples. Looking at the Cajon Pass, Don, I was thinking about your comment about the vegetation that often holds those slopes in place. And if you clear out that vegetation, you lose that stability. So let's not overlook things like that. So I don't know if that's an answer because it's a big question, but I think we really just need to change the paradigm and then incentivize people with funding and authority and flexibility to really tackle those things. But I, I do think one final plug on those learning by doing, mm -hmm. we gotta start now and let's see what we learn as we figure it out. And to make sure we share that information in the form of best practices so other can benefit. Don. Um, let me just follow up with that. Um, in terms of learning by doing, I think one of the, one of the hurdles uh, to the engineering practice in the United States is fear of making a mistake. Um, I, I've worked in other parts of the world that don't have that fear. And if they're in a situation where they need to find something out fast, they'll just try five different things let three of them fail and go forward with the other two. That, that they're willing to, to, to take some risks and see what works and let the data and, and the results drive what they do. So you know, if, if we're not sure about, about whether or not restoring wetlands will work, well, let's, let's try that. Let's try four other things and just go forward with whatever it is that works and we'll move forward much faster than if we attempt to over-engineer and design everything and make sure that we're never fail. Failure is a learning thing, and at this point, we need to learn. That's an excellent point. Thank you. Dennis, would you like to add? I, I can also add to that. Uh, we generally will not do something that Caltrans doesn't have an approved standard plan for. So uh, 
we're, we, lo we love to let Caltrans make the mistakes and fail because we do not have the resources to redo things. And my board gets very upset if we have to redo something that we just put in last year. So we're, we're definitely in that box where we go to the standard plan and look at what Caltrans says is the right thing to do and then build off of that. Failure is always an opportunity for improvement. So, uh, Don, you are really, you've been referred to as a rare combination of a big picture thinker and a detail-oriented traffic engineer. So how has Caltrans incorporated improved network redundancy in long-range plans as a key strategy for reducing risk? You gave us a terrific overview, and now if you can comment on that question. Um, we're certainly looking into it, and what we've developed is a tool to look at detour routing. So in the event that, that one part of the state highway system um, was closed, either short term or long term, what effect that would have on, on the users, how far they would have to detour around. So in one of the photographs that I showed is State Route 299, which goes between the Central Valley to the coast. There is not a, a, a nearby route to replace that. There is very little redundancy through the coastal range, and the loss of that one route meant that detours were going to take five or six hours. If you look at, high, at um, Interstate 5 going north from California to Oregon and then ask, well, where's the next closest multi-lane road, not a two-lane road, but multi-lane highway between California and the northwest, it's two states over. You don't find it until you get to Salt Lake City. Okay, there, so some parts of the system simply don't have much redundancy. In the Central Valley, it's a different story where there's lots and lots of, of county roads on basically a one mile grid. If you lost part of that, and as long as it wasn't something widespread like a flood that, that closed a lot of roads, you'd probably be okay. Um, one of the concerns we have is redundancy specifically for communities that are, have special dangers, wildfire dangers and that sort of thing, where it may only have two ways out and if the fire is coming from that direction, then you've lost one of them. And so redundancy in that situation is particularly important. I'm, I'm glad to see that someone took a look it, it, and you know, it did some timely action in the case of Paradise and produced a, an escape route. Um, but definitely looking at redundancy is important. Um, I would also say that when we worked on the SACOG Blueprint Project a while ago, um, redundancy was not just considered within the highways, but it was considered if you lost the, 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 um, the, the road network for some systemic reason, like a oil shortage or something, is there redundancy in terms of other, of other uh, modes? Do you have light rail, buses, and other things that, could, that you could use instead? So there's more than one type of resiliency. And thank you for commenting on one of the four R's of resiliency with your comments on redundancy. I'm very excited because we've got a question in the audience, I think. Yes, we do. And I just wanted to remind those in the audience, for those who have questions, if you could just start lining up, and then we'll go ahead with the questions. And please identify yourself. Uh, Mike Urabedian, uh, Sierra Club. Yeah. Question for Butte County. I'm wondering to what extent you use local hazard mitigation plan, your plan in the past, and how that might change now. Certainly we have our approved hazard mitigation uh, plan. That's one of those big white binders that uh, sits on, on my shelf. Uh, we have, have also used the hazard mitigation grant program. Uh, the, the, the challenge with those grants is they come out usually within a month or two after the disaster hits and you have a very short time frame in which to put your project together and to go through the cost benefit analysis and those type of things. So we do have a number of projects we were able to cram into that program. Um, th those will include both roadway projects and some flood, uh, flood safety projects, those type of things. So we, we do use it. It's the, the problem with those plans, I, I guess, would be they're, when they're printed, they're on their way to being outdated, and it's really hard to keep them up to date. But we do have a plan that is current, and uh, we do use those. Thank you. And Asha, before we turn to you, Commissioner, I understand you have a question. Okay. I, I, no, I thought we were going to do it. Uh, thank you. I just, uh, first of all, uh, want to thank all the speakers, including the moderator. Um, the issues you've brought up and uh, the suggested solutions are excellent. They, they don't 
begin to, you know, we can't get into enough depth in one day or probably in one month, but um, it's very, very uh, uh, interesting to hear you talk about it and think back about how uh, emergency communications, evacuation plans, multi-jurisdictional and multi-agency planning has changed since the 03 fires uh, that was my awakening down in San Diego. So just to, um, the things that jumped out on me from all the comments uh, were um, overall the general consensus that we need modern policy that is adaptive and able to respond to these changes. Scripps Institute uh, in down in La Jolla is looking at you know, many of these issues in a lot of detail. And they, they tell us that, um, that uh, let me see what I've got here. I have it. <clears throat> that eight or nine years of severe drought followed by one or two years of flooding, which is the, our last 10 year cycle. We've experienced that. Um, and now we're in a drenching phase. And they, pro they project these kind of up and down extreme, extremes for the next couple of hundred years is what they're currently thinking. So um, how do you, uh, uh, you know, from one extreme to the other seems to me, not as an en engineer, just as a person, a, a very challenging situation. So uh, the natural solutions it seems to be one great element. Mid-career training and professional training, and we see, you know, extra, um, uh, you know, professional standards for doctors and others that uh, have advanced training in particular areas. Maybe that's something that we could look at. Um, yeah. Also, investment in maintenance and, and really requiring it. I don't know how many times I've looked at uh, maintenance backlogs or, you know, panels like this where they say, it's a trillion dollars, it's five trillion dollars, it's ten trillion dollars. We, we need to really get realistic numbers and start chipping away Added, and I'm hoping the SB1 funding, uh, which is a permanent uh, increase over, you know, over the years, will start to reduce them, prioritizing what needs to be done first. Um, and then learning from others and making database decisions. Look at the massive flood control that they do in, in uh, Holland for only like 800 years. Uh, they, I think they really yeah. do know a few things. And we had the opportunity to tour the room for, room for the rivers planning uh, near the coast uh, a few years ago. And the, the, the level of detail, parcel by parcel, they had to go talk to the farmers about, you know, under this new plan, you may be flooded. You know, there's compensation or not, but let's talk. You can imagine what those town hall meetings were like. Absolutely. So, I mean, um, you know, I, I, we really, this, this is, none of this is going away, and maybe it's only going to get worse. So I, I applaud the work that you're doing, and uh, I just think there's tons of, tons of work for all of us to do, and so uh, this is a, a great discussion, great uh, of interest to me. So I just wanted to make that comment, but if anybody wants to reply, I'm open to that too. Thank you for that comment. Panelists. Well, if, if you say it's going to get worse, I just hope it picks a different county next, uh, next year. <laughs> Well, Dennis, as you said during your presentation, and I quote, you can't be resilient if we don't do maintenance. Asha. Thank you to the panelists for sharing your insights today. I'm Asha Weinstein Agrawal with the Minetta Transportation Institute. I'm interested in the question of integrating um, mitigation and resiliency planning. Um, and it's my understanding that it's often somewhat siloed. We have folks devoting themselves and their expertise to how we can reduce, for example, um, greenhouse gas emissions, and then others looking at how we can build our systems to respond well in the case of disaster. But there is obviously opportunity for these groups to be working at cross direction. So for example, um, as a transportation planner, I think density to support transit and all is great. But at some point, density can start to create heat islands. Um, which can be significant enough that in a heat wave you might have a much more severe crisis that people have to weather. So I'm interested if you have any insights in what the state can do, whether it's the Transportation Commission, Caltrans, otherwise, 
to help local governments in particular figure out how to integrate the mitigation and the resiliency planning? That's an easy question. You go, Liz. <laughs> um, that's a, such a great question. I love that. Um, there's some, you know, nature can play a role, surprisingly. From, you hear that from me, and I feel like a, I'm a broken record, but part of what um, we need to do is we need to bring those sectors together, and we need to think how, we need to have the metrics, and we need to have the outcomes that are consistent and are driving towards that larger outcome that we're trying to get to. So an opportunity that you mentioned, the density that reduces greenhouse gas emissions from VMT, a lot of more use of walking, biking, transit, but it creates a lot of concrete. And so, you know, I think the best practice that continues to evolve and continues to be embraced by a lot of, uh, by the state of California, but also a lot of local entities and the funding needs to follow that is a lot of urban forestry um, investment, bioswales, reduce the impact of stormwater and water quality through use of vegetation. Um, I think that's a natural combination um, to help both reduce the impacts of greenhouse gas emissions or the level of greenhouse gas emissions with the transportation sector and the natural working land sector. Um, I also think that um, one of the things I've been thinking about as we've been talking, hearing, and listening is my fear when we talk about redundancy is that we start to build all new roads in places that have high habitat value where there's already a fragmented wilderness. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a tough conversation to have, right? So uh, I just wanted to surface that because that also is about mitigation for impacts to species and habitats, which is another, that's habitat mitigation, it's not greenhouse gas em emissions. But one of the things that I think about is Highway 37 and so maybe you want to talk about this in your next, but um, what the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and the four counties and the local communities and the land trusts and the Coastal Conservancy are looking at there is first of all, um, invest in resiliency, invest in resilience that doesn't require habitat mitigation, right? Because if you can self-mitigate and have a design and a project that actually provides ecological lift, then you're not saddled by that requirement for habitat mitigation and that makes it um, easier and that from an environmental perspective, we, don't, we prefer that there are no impacts as opposed to impacting and then mitigating for that. And so that's a big challenge. I think with Highway 37, there probably will be impacts that will need to be mitigated from a habitat perspective, and what are the strategic approaches to do that in a way that supports everybody's goals? And so advanced mitigation is one that we're looking at through regional conservation investment strategies and other ecological um, improvements. So um, that's where this kind of multi-sector, getting out of our silos, there are solutions that if we um, bring other funding to the table and, um, and a will to, to look outside of ourselves, there's probably pretty creative solutions and best practices from other places could definitely help. And Liz, your perspective is particularly valued as you used to be a legislative assistant as well as the director of strategic planning for Amtrak's Western Division and now of course with your current position. So thank you for that well-rounded response. Panelists, would you like to add anything, Dennis or Don? <laughs> very, it was very well an answered. Well, so, well I, I, I will say I agree with the, with the um, person who brought up the question. Generally speaking, the resilience um, activities, things that you do to reduce uh, your, the carbon footprint of whatever organization you work for are quite separate from the adaptation things, what you're doing, knowing that changes are coming and, and how you're responding. Typically, those are separate. And as has been mentioned by several people, um, most of the solutions to that and, uh, occur on private property. You know, the, the, the issues on, on what you could do, for example, to stabilize a slope that's over a, a highway 
almost certainly that's on private property. And so you end up with a bunch of legal issues that, that, uh, that are tied up in this on how it is you would do what it is we think we ought to do. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is, is from my perspective uh, at a local, a small local county, um, we've got a bridge and the bridge is old and needs to be replaced and we're trying to figure out the most economical way to get that bridge, bridge replaced. And we certainly, we try to work with all the resource agencies, go through, now it's up to probably a three or four year process to get the permits in place in order to replace that bridge. Not replacing it, for the most part, isn't an option. So we're, we're pretty locked into our mode of what we have to do, and that could be anything from a bridge down to just culvert replacements. Those culverts that were all full of silt, uh, do we replace those in kind, or do we put a, a bottomless type of system in there? That's gonna be an economics. It's gonna be one of the key drivers. If I can do the culverts for 60,000, and it costs 200,000 to put a, a small bridge type of thing in, we're probably going for the culverts, unless there are uh, some real biological uh, resources there that we're trying to preserve. Thank you. Do we have any questions online? We do not. Okay, turning now to you. Hi, uh, I'm Allison Brooks. Thanks for the shout out, Liz. Uh, I'm, w I'm with the uh, Bay Area Regional Collaborative. We help coordinate the four regional agencies in the Bay Area, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, the Association of Bay Area Governments, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, and the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. And we're all working together on both mitigation and climate adaptation. And also have been the beneficiary of uh, some Cal uh, Caltrans grants to do work around adaptation. So I definitely want to acknowledge, uh, as was mentioned earlier, that our state transportation agency really is leading the charge on helping to think through strategies around um, climate adaptation and resilience. So uh, some of the things that we've been able to do and we're about to complete is uh, a Bay Area-wide uh, adaptation or um, study of our vulnerabilities around our transportation infrastructure, moving and also looking at our urbanized areas, our environmental uh, ecological systems, um, transportation, and also our most disadvantaged communities. Mm -hmm. We're also the recipient of some SB1 adaptation planning grants to take some of those strategies and really move them more deeply into uh, specific multi-benefit strategies to protect some of our assets. So um, I want to acknowledge uh, that, that this is an important contribution by uh, CTC and our state transportation agency, but it is insufficient. Uh, you know, our SB1 planning grants for adaptation are coming to a conclusion. We did, they've just uh, given out the last round. Um, and so I just think it's critically important as a state we need to be investing in the kinds of planning that's going to help us to produce these multi-benefit outcomes because really how to deal with adaptation and resiliency, and this has been mentioned by the panelists, is breaking out of our silos and really thinking about the integration of all of, all of these, uh, all of the, how these systems all work together uh, to produce the kind of results with, that we need to see. And I'll just give one example from the CTC itself You've been uh, investing in these really um, you know, important work that we want to share, some of these um, pilot programs that really break down silos and develop these multi-benefit, multi-multiple solutions to address flooding and sea level rise. Yet at the same time, you know, thinking about the uh, shop program and investing in how we keep our highway systems kind of at their current uh, state of repair and I think it's important in any, uh, which has a, a significant amount of resources, I think in any investment that's coming out of any department, we need to be thinking about how it's producing results, multimodal results, that's both, both tackling mitigation and adaptation at the same time. Absolutely, and was there a question for our panelists? Uh, well, I wanted to, and maybe the panelists can't uh, suggest this, but it is a question for the CTC. So how is the CTC as an agency starting to integrate adaptation more fully into all its funding streams to support the kinds of outcomes that we're talking about here? And upping, uh, upping <coughs> the grant program available to do the kind of planning that we're talking about, which is insufficient at, this, at a state of our size um, to help us actually start to implement these mm -hmm. strategies that we need to, to do to 
to address what we're talking about. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, yes, Liz. Thanks. Thanks, Allison. Great question. Um, and I think maybe Susan might want to say something, but can I just, um, just reiterate a couple things that I suggested? One is um, that $20 million pot is gone. And I know this is not a CTC decision. Maybe not. I don't know. Don't know if maybe. We'll let you CTC got, so, answer. But let's figure out how to reinvest in that pilot project. And that could be a legislative suggestion to provide more funding. Um, $20 million goes by pretty quickly. I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel in terms of the guidelines. The guidelines are pretty solid. And let's take that opportunity to do that. And then the second thing I, I mentioned that I just want to reiterate, if that's OK, is um, that provision in SB1 um, could be tightened legislatively to make it more of a, you know, uh, you have to hit that bar rather than it's just kind of a nice thing to do, you know? Um, does that need to be tightened from an um, authorization perspective? Or, and, or could CTC require that on every single investment decision? What are you doing to ensure that this facility, this investment is resilient in 2100? Susan. And if I, if I could. <laughs> okay, yeah, I just wanted to, um, first I wanted to thank the panel and the moderator and thank all of you for being here today. I just, there's been a couple of questions raised about the commission and what the commission has done with regards to adaptation and resiliency. And over the years, I guess I'll just talk most recently, the commission has a role in adopting guidelines for the preparation of regional transportation plans, as well as now also the California transportation plan. And in those guidelines, both for the regions as well as for Cal uh, Caltrans, the commission has spent a great deal of effort working with a number of experts. And I know, you know Liz has really been helpful for us. And um, working with all everyone throughout California that wants to help us, on how to provide guidance that will require that in the planning process, resiliency and adaptation is very carefully taken into consideration in all of these plans. Most recently in the California Transportation Plan with regards to Caltrans, the commission in the guidelines is requiring that Caltrans does not just prepare a transportation program or plan that is just seeking input from the transportation professionals. So it would require that Caltrans is working closely with the Air Resources Board, Natural Resources Agency, Strategic Growth Council, Governor's Office of Planning and Research, in addition to all the regions and the local governments and the experts in the worlds of climate change and adaptation and resiliency. I think, you know, one thing that I, I wanted to just um, the reason why this forum, this panel, is so very important to the commission, and you know, while we, all, we have a few commissioners here in the audience, we do have commissioners that are viewing this webcast today. This is so important for us because this is where we learn from experts. We learn from those of you who have attended today and, and are asking questions to inform the policy recommendations that the commission uh, works to make uh, to improve the program, transportation program moving forward by uh, fulfilling its role in advising and assisting the legislature and the uh, transportation agency secretary. And I'll give you an example. Several years ago, the commission made a recommendation for regional advanced mitigation and setting aside some money that would be able to um, be used to, to explore and to have some pilot projects and that um, regional advanced mitigation program is now there's a state advanced mitigation program that Caltrans is leading. And we're watching all of the, you know, this closely to see how that might work and how we can integrate our transportation infrastructure investments in a more holistic and comprehensive fashion. So today I'm taking a lot of notes and the commissioners are here today and uh, we will be going back and and listening and going back through, probably viewing the webcast again, 
And thinking through what would be good solid recommendations for the legislature to consider the legislative staff. And I, I also just really want to thank today. I know that there's a number of legislative staff in, attending or hopefully viewing. And I just want to thank all of you also for being here because we're all partners and we all need to do what we can to comprehensively address the situation that we're facing right now, but well into the future. And we do need to more strategically invest. And I think that's something that everyone here today agrees on. So I hope I answered some of the questions that were raised. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Thank you. That was very helpful. Hi, my name is Debbie Hale. I'm with the Transportation Agency for Monterey County. And maybe it's just our county or maybe it's statewide, but we've been fortunate to have some great planning efforts going on in our county. And so what I am thinking about really is the next step, the implementation that you've all talked about. And how do we break down those funding cycles whereby the shop says you've got to put your money into this but not that, and the um, STIP says you've got to put your money into this but not that, and um, some examples might, might be helpful. Um, so in the Highway 1 corridor, for example, in order to keep from flooding the rail line, um, it, you can open up the gates underneath it. But if you open up the gates, it's going to flood three or four places in the county roadway. But the county isn't the place where the money is available. The money is available from the state. So that's just one of the funding silos in order to protect this state, or actually it's the private the railroad that they're not going to invest money in, but it's a state service on that railroad. We need to fix county roads. Um, there's another project we've got called Carmel Free that does a great job of integrating, um, what do you call multi-benefit, nature improvements, expanding the bench lines where the river can flood into that instead of flooding the highway or instead of flooding the housing a long way. It's a really great multi-benefit project, but I can't quite claim transportation money for it because it's mostly a nature-related improvement. And so the project is moving along, but we're just not sure how we're gonna break down these funding silos to make this project that's gonna have great transportation benefits be fundable because it doesn't fit into one of the slots. So I guess wow. my question is, do we need legislation? Do we just need um, different regulations? Or do we need um, a different mindset at, at say Caltrans to change this? What, what do you think is needed? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I, I would suggest that, that starts with the definition of the project. Hmm. So if the project is the road, then you're going to get funding for the road. If the definition of the project expands to the, to the nearby areas and, you know, for example, um, the, the, uh, whatever wildlife refuge, whatever, um, whatever slopes are occurring, the estuary that it's going over, if all that is defined as the project, then the funding is going to be um, done a different way. So I would say that it all depends on how you define the project. Of course, defining the lead agency would also be an issue when you get to that. Um, all I can say is if you find the answer, I'd like to know what it is, because we've got a couple of problem, problems like that as well. Certainly Highway 99 north of Chico, it's been, I think, uh, three or four days had water over it during the uh, floods this winter, uh, or springtime, rather. And that's one of those problems that originates about a mile and a half upstream at the bifurcation point between Rock Creek and Kiefer Slough. And uh, the, the county made a run at that previously, and it was bringing all the partners in. They had Corps of Engineers and a lot of other players, Department of Water Resources in. So I think that's probably going to be the mix that you're going to have to have is, uh, is that type of mix to bring everybody to the table to try to find funding. Our project unfortunately didn't get constructed because they couldn't get consensus on what the repair needed to be and they couldn't come up with their match of the funding. So funding is always, in my world, the funding is, is the biggest question because without the proper funding in place or the ability to get that funding in place, the project's not gonna move forward. So I, I share your pain and let me know if you find the solution. We learn from each other, Liz. That's such a great question, and if anybody has seen the Carmel Free project, it is really, you could just see it. You see how you invest in the river to allow for the waters to ebb and flow as opposed to topping over the highway, which then shuts down the highway. It's just such a, visually you can see it, 
and I think Debbie, you've just asked the eight hundred million thousand dollar question. One thought, just thinking about it, is what we're trying to get here, get to here, is different sectors coming together towards solutions that apply to those sectors, right? So you have the natural resource agencies and the you know land trust and the environmental sectors coming forward and saying. This is, this is a resource that's being damaged. Let's figure out a way that we can improve this resource and allow for nature to use that power to reduce the impacts on the highway. And the transportation sector saying, this highway is being damaged, it's going to collapse, it's being shut down now, how can we improve it? And with those silos and funding and those rigid policies, people have so many reasons to say no. Right? We just have to go back to what we know because I'm under stress here. What if there is kind of an innovative expedited permitting approach that if there are improvements to those multiple sectors, then there is more of a highlight or a focus that brings together those various sectors, including the regulators, to have that multiple benefit solution and some of those rigid requirements are relaxed because I know that I'm, when I'm coming to this, I know that the things I care about are going to be improved, and my counterpart, who I usually fight with, they know that they're the things they care about will be approved, improved too. And so for some of these projects that have these multiple benefit solutions, multiple outcomes, including equity and disadvantaged communities, what if we can get together and have some of those creative piloting creative permitting schemes. And so it's those types of things that I think advanced mitigation, we're deep into that and we're realizing that um, we have to push through some of, this, um, some of this resistance to doing something different, right? And I think that's where funding and license and um, focus really comes. And I'm hopeful that that will happen uh, in Highway 37 and the Carmel Free and that, you know. I feel like we're at that cusp that we just have to push through um, business as usual. Thank you. Okay, any questions online? Not yet. Okay. We have time for one last question from our audience member. Hi, it's Nader Afzal, I'm from California Air Resources Board. Uh, my question is more about uh, breaking the silos that you all mentioned. So 100 Cities Resilience Project by uh, uh, Rockefeller Foundation is, I think, is running out of funding for, for this upcoming year and after, afterwards. Uh, that was supposed to uh, provide funding for chief resilience officers in local government. So um, I don't know to what extent that project has been successful, but what's, what's your solution for breaking that silo? Is it about like, um, chief resilience officers just trying to work between different departments and agencies, or it's about a new regulation, what, what do you suggest? Um, in, in my experience in California, having grown up somewhere else, um, the problems in California, the, the, biggest, uh, the, the biggest resource constraint in California is consensus. There are plenty, uh, there's plenty of money, there's plenty of natural resources, there's a, a wonderful talent pool, but getting people to agree on things turns out to be a very big problem here. Um, there's lots of diversity of opinions, and, and it's hard to get bring, bring people together. So my suggestion is that there is just going to have to be lots and lots and lots of talks and meetings and other things to get people pointed in the same direction and moving in the same direction on climate change. Um, that, that's certainly what we found in, uh, um, in our work with Caltrans. Um, not necessarily any resistance, we don't want to do stuff. A lot of it was agencies tell us, saying, just tell us what to do. Or, or saying, you know, you've thought about this thing, what we have this other thing you have to think about too. And so there are, coming off the Caltrans work, there are other agencies, um, different councils of government and other things that want to take that stuff and move on with it. Um, councils of government, in, in my opinion, are probably the logical place to do this. They've got their member agencies, and you may just have to have meeting after meeting and city after city 
one city council, one county board of supervisors after another until you get people pointed in the same direction on this. Um, I, I think the expertise is there, but I don't think the consensus is there yet. And if the consensus is in place, then I think funding and a few other things will fall into place. Yeah, I don't know that I really have anything to add to that. Uh, I guess by default under the ICS system, I am the resiliency officer until I, I can bring one in. So at, at the county level, it's probably me would be the, the guy. And uh, we, we've not, uh, we've had high level discussions with our board about that, those concepts, but we really haven't developed it beyond that. Uh, we're, we're basically uh, triaging our, our challenges every day. Um, yeah, it's disappointed. It's disappointing that they're shutting down that program. Um, I think in terms of energy, I, I think it needs to be somebody's job to do this work, but it can't stop there. And so I think um, the Caltrans, you know, climate change folks have been trying really hard. They've been doing great work. There's a lot of um, energy. There's a lot of focus, a lot of support by the CTC, a lot of support by um, regions. But I think that it needs to expand beyond that and be really a part of everybody's job. Everybody's job. But if there's nobody leading it, there's no kind of vortex, right? There's no gravity and there's no opportunity. Um, I, I, had, I was speaking with the uh, Chief Resilience Officer for the city of um, San Francisco a couple of months ago and I asked him how he, how he liked the program, and he said it really was helpful to him because it was his job to, commit, to connect, learn best practices, and then figure out how to populate and essentially influence stake, you know, his city government to incorporate those things. And he didn't do it alone. He pulled a lot of people, connected with a lot, including MTC and um, the policy group and ABAG. And so anyway, I'm just, saying yes, we need to have people in those positions, but they, it just can't stop there. Well, thank you. Before I turn it over to Commissioner Inman for some wrap-up comments, I'd like to thank all of you. It's been a pleasure to moderate this panel, and today we've heard so many wonderful lessons, and we've also learned how critically important it is to design structures and systems that can withstand threats, incorporating redundancy, and decentralizing critical operations. Combined, that will reduce vulnerability. Collectively, we also heard we must work together, breaking down silos to improve resilience and to reduce potential losses from disaster. I thank you for being with us this morning. So thank you, Karen, and the fantastic panel and our team at CTC uh, for organizing us. And I obviously did not have a good resiliency plan this morning myself to avoid those SB1 detours, but uh, here I am. A little more information would have helped my Uber driver, but apologize for being late. Um, I was reminded yesterday at my house of worship that the sign of a good leader was to listen first. So on behalf of my fellow commissioners and our staff, we've been busy listening to you all today. So I think it's very, very important. Things I would like to just add, one is like there's some short-term things we can do right now and we should be doing. And one is make sure all those cell phone numbers are update. So when we do have that next, uh, incident, which we know ha will happen momentarily. We had it yesterday, unfortunately, in Gilroy, I think, by a man-made, and I was thinking of the evacuation routes as I watched the news last night. But I think for all of us, make sure all your numbers are current at CTC. They do a good job of tracking down our home phone numbers and our cell numbers. And so wherever you are, please just reach out and make sure that you're current. Uh, also, I love Dennis talking about those binders that get us all compliant, and that's, that's great what we need to do, but those two pagers are where we really come together. So for all of us, let's have those two pagers that we're gonna do. 
uh, and the short term and the medium term and the longer term. So I just want to say thank you to everyone and to everyone who's been watching us remotely or who took the time uh, to join us today. I hope that we have an opportunity for folks to share comments. If you didn't uh, come to the microphone but something is triggered something in your mind, please share that with our staff and we'll make sure that we put up an email address so everybody can communicate because one of the other things, um, and I think it was Don that talked about the institutional knowledge and I really kind of worry that that might get away. And so we need to really find a way, I think, to really debrief with the guys and gals that are you know, in the trenches, so to speak, every day and have some really good ideas, but because this is how we always do things, we may lose that opportunity. So let's make sure what, whatever perch we sit on to make sure that we have the ability in, in place to capture a whole range of ideas. And, you know, we'll have to figure out the balancing and everything, but I do think um, that I, I worry that we'll lose some of that institutional knowledge that uh, has served us so well. So with that, we're going to break for lunch, and we will be back here to start promptly at 1. I'm not going very far, so I won't be late. Um, but thank you all so much.